Good morning and a very warm welcome to our online service for the 22nd of November. Hopefully you've managed to find the online order of service with the songs and readings for a time of worship as we prepare to look at God's word together. We're looking at John 14 for our last time before we move into John 15 for our last service in November as we head back towards our motto. Uh, we're going to finish that off by, um, by next week because the following week we'll be into December. And then we'll start our Advent and our Christmas services. Just just let you know something about those. We'll give out more details as the next week or two unfolds as we get towards December. But let me just outline one or two things. Firstly, over the course of the first 18 days in December, we will have an Advent devotion time on Zoom every day. Now, we appreciate that not everybody is going to be able to meet every day. And indeed, some days, maybe only one or two will be able to meet. But hopefully you'll be able to set aside just five or ten minutes uh, for some of the days in December to be able to meet with us. We're just going to share a, a brief word from, from Scripture and something to pray about for the day. We appreciate that some people um, are not able to meet in evenings, some people not in mornings. And so we've spread out the service times, some first thing in the morning, some in the evening and some over lunchtime as well just for a brief time, just to meet around God's word and to pray together at the beginning, middle and end of the day. So that will be over the first uh, 18 days of December. That will be on Zoom. We appreciate that not everybody has access to Zoom and is able to get online. And so those uh, devotions will be recorded so that we'll be able to distribute them uh, to people so that they can um, be involved in what we're doing together. Also to say that hopefully as we get into December and the current lockdown uh, restrictions come to an end that we will be able to go ahead with our planned Christmas services over the Sundays in December as normal. Now of course we have to be aware that uh, we don't quite know what December is going to look like but we'll give you more details as information unfolds regarding that and as we get into the 19th of December uh, the final Sunday before Christmas we will have a carol service together and uh, we'll explain the details of that and what that's going to look like as we get into December as well. Let's turn to John 14 then and we won't read the whole chapter together but we'll focus more on the verses that we're going to be looking at uh, today. And so if I start reading to you from verse 12 and then we'll read through to verse uh, to the end of the chapter to verse 31. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own, they belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. 
You heard me say I am going away, and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you now, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. Shall we pray as we come to God's word? Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it is precious to us, that it is relevant, that it is true, that it is uh, alive and uh, sharp. Lord, we do pray that as we read it together, we would um, be engaged with your words. We thank you that we get to read Jesus' very words this morning, that he spoke to his followers, challenging them and comforting them. Lord, we thank you for the translators who, who translated these words into our language so that we can freely open the, them this morning and understand these words in, in our own tongue. Lord, we do thank you for that, that we have this, this freedom and ability to, to access your word. Uh, this morning. We do pray that we would not take this time and opportunity for granted. In your name we ask. Amen. This is our final look at John chapter 14. We started last week looking at these three questions that Jesus uh, was asked by his disciples. The idea was originally to look at those three questions all last week, but there's simply too much to look at. Indeed, really, there's so much in John 14 that we're just not going to have the chance to look at. So I trust you'll go away and perhaps spend some time looking at some of these uh, wonderful, comforting and challenging words in John chapter 14. So we're just really going to focus down on the last of the three questions that Jesus is asked. Three questions asked by Thomas, Philip and Judas, son of James, three of the quieter disciples. If you were to guess which disciples spoke up, from the other Gospels, of Matthew, Mark and Luke, you'd expect someone like Peter to be speaking on behalf of the disciples. You'd expect James and John and Andrew to be asking questions. But these disciples elsewhere, we really know very little of in Matthew, Mark and Luke. Thomas, Philip and Judas, son of James, they say uh, next to nothing in those Gospels. But John uh, brings these quieter disciples to the forefront and the questions that they have and perhaps... Um, uh, some of us have these same questions and will benefit from hearing what they ask Jesus. So this final question is asked by Judas. Obviously, that's not Judas Iscariot, who has in previous verses left to betray Jesus, the end of chapter 13. And just to clear up the confusion here, in case there was any, John does say to us, this is Judas, but it's, it's not Judas Iscariot who spoke to Jesus. So just in case anybody thought, well, perhaps Judas has returned, perhaps he's uh, forgotten his keys, perhaps he's uh, repented of his, uh, of his desire to betray Jesus. John lets us know, no, this is definitely the other Judas. In Luke, he's called Judas, son of James in Luke's gospel. Matthew and Mark give him another name, Thaddeus. Perhaps that was a name that uh, this man took uh, later on in life, you could imagine that the name Judas was not really a name you'd want to be associated with. And so perhaps he took up the name Thaddeus for those reasons. But this man here named Judas, not Judas Iscariot, says in verse 22, Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us, but not to the world? Now in verses 16 to 21, the verses that lead up to this question, Jesus explains different ways in which he would reveal himself, he would show himself to his disciples so that they would know him, they would see him and they would love him. These different displays of his character to his disciples. But each time Jesus says that the rest of the world will not be able to see and know and love Jesus. He will not reveal himself to the rest of the world in the same way that he does to his own disciples. And so naturally Judas asks, well, well, why is that the case? How is it that you're going to reveal yourself to us, but you're not going to do this for the rest of the world? Why not do things that the whole world will see? 
Why not say things that the whole world will hear? Why not perform a miracle that will cause the whole world to believe? Judas isn't the first person to ask this question. Jesus' brothers, or really his half-brothers, asked him a very similar question back in John chapter 7. Now in John 7 there was a big festival, and as they would have gone up to this festival in Jerusalem, it would have felt like the whole world was there. And Jesus decides to go up in secret, to go up privately to that festival. And so Jesus' brothers say to him, well look, nobody who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, since you're performing these miracles, why not show yourself to the world? The whole world's going to be in Jerusalem, as it were, people from all over the place. Why not do something for the crowds, for everyone to see? If you can imagine seeing the Beatles before they were famous, as they're playing small clubs just to a few people around the city of Liverpool, you might say to them, well, why are you playing these songs to tiny venues, just to a handful of people? Why, why not travel the world with these songs? You should be playing to, to, to Glastonbury and to, and to Madison Square Garden. You should be filling football stadiums. Well, in a way, that's what Judas is asking in John 14. That's what his brothers were asking in John chapter 7. Why would you show yourself just to a few disciples, just to a handful of people? Why not travel uh, the world with this message? Why not perform the, these miracles for everyone to see? Why travel just around the back streets of Galilee? playing to these small crowds. You ought to be a celebrity. His brother say, you ought to be a public figure. You need to do the world tour. This is a question people ask today in a slightly different way. People say things like this. If Jesus really was the son of God, if he really is the saviour of the world, then why doesn't he just prove it to everyone? Why doesn't he show everyone? Why doesn't he reveal himself in this way to the whole world. Why not write letters on the sky in the clouds? Jesus is the saviour of the world. Then everybody would believe. Why not appear in glory in such a way that every eye would see him? Why not give the world hard evidence? Why not give the world proof? Well, it is a good question, but then proof isn't always what it's made out to be. Think of the proof for Jesus' resurrection. The Old Testament, which the disciples knew well, the Old Testament prophesied Jesus and his resurrection. Jesus himself prophesied his own resurrection. And in fact, he prophesied all the events leading up to his resurrection, which came true. Some of the disciples saw Jesus die, saw him being buried, and three days later saw the empty tomb and the stone rolled away. They saw angels announcing that Jesus was alive. The women with them saw Jesus in person, as did other disciples throughout that day. Jesus himself even appeared to all the disciples. He spoke to them. He showed them the scars on his hands and his feet from the cross to identify himself. And yet still, they didn't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. How much proof do you need? See, proof is good, proof is important, but it's not the end of the world. So in this section, Jesus explains how and why he reveals himself to his disciples in a unique way, but also he does show that he will reveal himself to the world through his disciples. The first thing we'll look at together is that Jesus reveals himself to the disciples because they are family. One of the great themes of John's gospel is his use of family language, of relationship language. So John most often uh, speaks of Jesus as being the son. And John usually calls God the father. In fact, John calls God the father more times than he calls him God. And we've seen before the use of relationship language in John, family and community language. He often speaks about love, God's love for us, our love for God, the Father's love for the Son, the Son's love for the Father, our love for each other as Christians. And John speaks about Jesus' followers as being 
God's children who are loved by their heavenly father. So you've got this uh, family relationship language in John's gospel. And here in John 14, that kind of language continues. So look at verse two. Jesus is going to prepare a place for us. Where's that place going to be? It's going to be in the father's house. Why is it that we have a place in the father's house? Well, it's because we're family. We don't simply have a place on, uh, we're not simply neighbours of God. We don't live down the street from the father. We're family. We live in the house. But we're not yet in the father's house, as we find out in verse 23, where Jesus says that the father and the son will make our lives their house. We're not yet in the father's house. Jesus has not yet come back to take us to be where he is. But in the meantime, our lives become a house for the father and the son. Our lives become this family home, as it were, where God lives with his people. What happens when a family breaks down? Well, children become orphans. And so when Jesus speaks about leaving his disciples, when he speaks of this breakdown in their relationship, he uses this orphan language in verse 18. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So even though Jesus is leaving his disciples and that feels like a like a family breakup, he ensures them that he will still know them. They will still know him. They will still have this togetherness even after Jesus has left. And Jesus uses this family language to answer Judas's question. Why will Jesus be known and seen and revealed to his disciples, but not to the world? Well, because they're family. Nobody knows you like family does. Let's go back to the illustration of the singer who goes from playing those small clubs to going on the world tour and selling out stadiums. It doesn't matter how big the crowds are. It doesn't matter how full the stadiums are or how long the world tour lasts, the audience will never be as close to the singer as his family will. They'll never know the singer as well as his parents or his wife knows him. They'll never love him in the same way that his children do, that his family do. And so as part of God's family, Jesus is known to us in a way that the rest of the world doesn't know him. Jesus spells that out in some way. Some of the, the blessings and benefits of being part of God's family and the way he reveals himself to us, especially in family terms. So in verses 13 and 14, we're told there we can ask God for anything because he's our father. If a stranger asks you for something, you might think twice about saying yes. But if your son or daughter asks you for something... Well, that's a different matter. So Jesus says, when we ask God for something, we're like children asking their father. Now, of course, those of you who are parents and grandparents will know that a father or a mother is more likely to give their children something when the children are in the good books, when the children are behaving themselves and, uh, and, and deserving of something from their parents. In those verses, Jesus says that we can ask God for anything because we're asking in his name. We're asking the name of Jesus and Jesus is the son of God. And the son of God is always in, as it were, the father's good books. He is always pleasing to his father and therefore we can ask for anything in his name and he will grant it. Another way in which God's family knows him in a special and unique way that the world doesn't is in verses 16 to 17. We know God by the Holy Spirit who is sent to us. Again, in verse 17, Jesus explains that the Holy Spirit is not given to the world, but only to God's family. In verse 19, we see Jesus in the way the world does not see him. In verse 23, we love Jesus in a way that the world cannot love him. And in verse 27, we have a peace that the world does not have because we are part of God's family. So when Judas asks, why are you showing yourself to us rather than to the whole world? 
The answer is at least in part because we enjoy a special relationship with Jesus that the world does not have. When Judas says, why not reveal yourself to the world? I assume Judas is expecting some kind of extravagant miracle where Jesus could display his, his great power to the whole world to grab everybody's attention. Some great world shattering display of his might that would get everybody talking and believing in him. But in this passage, we see that Jesus does plan to reveal himself to the world, just not in that way. This passage does show that Jesus will reveal himself to the whole world. So look at how he does that in a couple of ways. Firstly, he does it through his people. To illustrate this, I want to look at just one verse in this passage to show how this takes place. It's one of the most striking verses in the whole passage, if not the whole chapter. It's verse 12, the verse we started reading at earlier. It says this, Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. This verse has been used to try and prove all sorts of things. And so I think it might be helpful for us to go through it a little bit and to see what it has to say and how it helps us to understand that Jesus will reveal himself to the whole world, but he has a certain way of doing that. Some Christians have understood this verse to mean that we will do greater miracles than Jesus, that we as Christians will do more impressive miracles or miracles that display a greater power than even Jesus displayed. See, Jesus in this verse says that we will do the works he has been doing and even greater ones. And when the Bible speaks about the works of Jesus, that's often, that's usually a way of speaking about Jesus's miracles. Not exclusively, and particularly in John's gospel here, sometimes the works of Jesus or the work of Jesus refers to his whole ministry, to his teaching, to his mission here on earth. But usually when the word works is used, it's speaking of God's work, miraculous work, supernatural work. So when Jesus says, we will do his works and even greater works, well, some say, well, this must mean that we will do the same miracles as Jesus and even greater miracles. So is, it, is that what this verse means? That we will do the same miracles as Jesus, but we will we'll go to the next level. Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Well, maybe we'll feed 6,000 people with four loaves and one fish. Jesus raised Lazarus after Lazarus had been buried for four days. Well, perhaps we'll raise people from the dead who have been dead and in the tomb for a week or more. Jesus walked on the water. Does this mean we'll hop, skip and jump on the water? Will we do Jesus' miracles, but better and greater? Many Christians have realised that that was not what Jesus was saying, or at least certainly not in that way. In any case, listen to the verse. It says, whoever believes in me, anyone who believes in me, all those who come to me will do the same works and even greater. So if that's the case, we must assume that if you're a Christian, you will be raising the dead. You will be walking on the water. You will be feeding the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, if that's what this verse means. So many Christians have realised that the verse simply cannot mean that. Instead, many say, well, Jesus must have meant greater works in terms of the quantity of works that we will do. After all, Jesus only ministered on earth for three years. Only so many miracles Jesus could have done in three years. He travelled only the course of, of, of one country. There's only so many square feet and square miles he could have covered. Only a handful of the world's population he could have met. But Christians will have a greater impact in some way because we will be able to reach millions, if not billions of people from all over the world. And so in that sense, the works that we do as Christians are greater 
because of the size of the impact, so some people say. Jesus was only one man who could only meet face to face with so many people during his lifetime, but Christians across the course of human history will be able to reach people from the four corners of the world, and therefore, in that sense, our works are greater in terms of quantity. But does that hold up? If Jesus meant more works, well, why did he say greater works? Why didn't he just say more works here if that's what he meant? And secondly, if the works of Jesus here are his miracles, then why did he say we would do the same works as Jesus? So how are we going to go about working through this verse and having a, a healthy understanding of what Jesus meant here? This is going to help us understand how Jesus will reveal himself to the world and therefore uh, answer Judas's question. Well, John gives us the answer to what this verse means, I believe. And John will have expected that we would know the answer by the time we got to chapter 14, because he'd already told us what this verse means earlier on in his gospel. Because in John chapter 5, Jesus explains what this means. Jesus in John chapter 5 had healed a lame man. He'd healed this man on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a day when you're not allowed to work. And so Jesus was doing his work on a day that you weren't allowed to work on. It was the Jewish day of rest. To work on the Sabbath was against Jewish law. And so the religious leaders are upset that Jesus is working. Here's Jesus' response in John 5 and verse 20. He says, the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Remember, same language in John 14, that uh, why do you show yourself to us and, and not to the rest of the world? Well, here, Jesus says, the father shows himself to me and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. So he have the same language in John 14 all the way back in John 5, that the Father, God, will show God the Son, Jesus, he will show him even greater works than these. Same phrase. Jesus says that while on earth, he was doing the works that God gave him to do. But God would give him even greater works to do than these miracles that the religious leaders were complaining about. So what are the greater works in John 5 that Jesus was speaking about? Well, he tells us we don't have to guess what they are. So by the time we come to John 14, we've already got a framework for understanding what the greater works are. Because here in John 5, we're told in the very next verse, verse 21 of John chapter 5. It says, the Father's going to show me greater works. What are the greater works? John 5, 21. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life... Even so, the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. When Jesus speaks about the greater works that would happen, he's speaking of, according to this chapter here, of giving life and raising the dead. Now, it doesn't mean raising the dead in terms of physically uh, bringing people out of, of tombs after they've passed away. He's talking here about spiritually raising people to new life, about giving people new life. And the next few verses just explain that's exactly what Jesus meant. So let me read them to you. He says, very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. You have eternal life. You've not been judged. You've crossed over from death to life. You've been resurrected when you believed in Jesus. You had a new life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of God and those who hear will live. Jesus is speaking about that when we put our faith in him, it's like we're raised from the dead. We have a new life. The Bible says once we were dead in our sins, we had an old life that led to death. But now, because of faith in Jesus, because of his work on the cross, we can now have new life in him. It's like we're raised from the dead. It's, it's like we come out of that spiritual tomb and we're set free. And Jesus says, this is, is the greater work that the Father has to do through the Son. And 
through his disciples as well. It's the work of bringing people to uh, faith in Jesus, a, a spiritual resurrection, a new life in him. You see, the people were amazed that Jesus healed a lame man. But Jesus says, well, having new legs is a great work of God, but having a new life is a greater work. This is the greater work he has to do. It's the work of, of the gospel as it gives new life to those who believe in Jesus. In fact, Jesus often does this with his miracles. He explains, look, this is a great miracle and you're amazed by it. But there's a greater miracle. He says in, 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 in here, John 5, 20, there's a greater miracle that's really going to amaze you. And so Jesus does this all the time with his miracles. In chapter six, he feeds 5,000 people with a, with a bit of bread and the crowds are amazed at what Jesus did. But he says to them, he says, you think that's amazing? That I can give you food that will satisfy your hunger for a few hours? He said, well, there's a greater work than that. Because if you put your faith in me, it's like, it's like feeding on a living bread that will satisfy your spiritual hunger forever. So he says that there's a greater work beyond this miracle or in chapter nine another great work where Jesus heals a blind man and Jesus explains it well that was great but but the greater work is that Jesus can open the eyes of the spiritually blind to be able to see Jesus with the eyes of faith healing people who are physically blind is a great work but there's a greater work healing the spiritually blind and, and the same is true in John 11, as Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus. What a great work. May I say the greatest of Jesus' miracles as Lazarus walks out the tomb four days after he'd been buried there. But Jesus says to Mary and Martha, there's something greater. I am the resurrection and the life. Look, Lazarus has come out of the tomb, but, but one day Lazarus is going to die again. But if you believe in me, you will never die, he says, because I can give you an eternal life that goes beyond death and will never die. This is the backdrop of Jesus' teaching. This is the framework that John has given us so that when we come to John 14 and we read that we will be doing greater works, we know that Jesus has already explained what those are. So when Jesus says we will do the same works, only greater, he's saying that our works are the same as Jesus' works. Jesus fed people with bread. Jesus opened the eyes of the blind, Jesus raised the dead. Well, we're going to do the same. But the bread that we have to feed people is the living bread that satisfies eternal hunger. The eyes that we will open through the gospel, through the power of Jesus at work in us as we witness and share with people what Jesus has done. And the gospel message is that he will open blind eyes for all eternity. That he'll bring people back from spiritual death. That's a greater work. That's an eternal work. Our work will be greater because we have living bread. We can open spiritually blind eyes. We can raise the spiritually dead through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in his people. Let's go back to that verse in John 14. Jesus says, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater works than these because... I am going to the Father. So the greater things that we will do in the name of Jesus are because he's going to the Father. In other words, Jesus' resurrection and his return to heaven, his ascension, changes things. It's because of those things that we will do greater works. As Jesus ascends into heaven to sit at the right hand of his father, to take up his heavenly throne, to reign as the ascended, risen, victorious king of kings over death, he ushers in something new, something greater. It marks the beginning of what the Bible calls the new covenant. The Bible promised that something greater would come, a new covenant, a new relationship between us and God. The Bible says that the Old Testament, what the Bible sometimes calls the Old Covenant, was full of signposts that pointed to something greater. It says that the things the people did in the Old Testament were kind of like shadows. A shadow of an object tells you what the object is like. 
So you can look at a shadow and you can work out the rough shape and maybe even the size of the object by looking at the shadow. You can tell something about what the substance, what the, what the object looks like. But the shadow isn't the object itself. So the Bible says this, that the religious practices in the Old Testament, the things that God gave his people to do, like keeping the Sabbath, like the festivals and ceremonies, like circumcision and those rituals that they did, said those things were a shadow of the things that were to come. They're not the reality themselves. The reality is found in Jesus. All of those things were great, but they're saying one day there's going to be something greater. These shadows, these, these signposts that point towards something, well, well, they're great. And God's given us these things to do. But he's given us these things to point towards something greater. They're shadows that point towards an object, point towards a reality. Well, what is that object? The object is Jesus. They're pointing towards him. The realities are in Christ, the Bible says. They point to his death. They point to his resurrection, his ascension. They point to the good news of Jesus going out into the whole world. And now the greater things are here. Jesus is on his throne. He is reigning. He is the risen King of Kings. And therefore we no longer live in the shadows. We live in the reality that Christ has won. That Christ is reigning. But let's make sure we've got this clear because it would be very easy to, to twist those words if we're not careful and we don't get the right balance. We are not greater than Jesus. We're not more important. The things that we will do are not reflections of us. When Jesus says you will do greater things, it's not anything to do with our greatness it's not any reflection on our abilities or talents. It is because of Jesus, because he's going to the Father. So it's not that we're more important or greater. These works do not imply that we have more power than Jesus or indeed that we have any power at all. It implies that he's on the throne and he has given us authority. He has given us a mission. He has given us and called us to do things in his name. Our work is greater because Jesus has gone to the Father. It's greater because once he had gone to the Father, he would send his Holy Spirit, as he speaks about here in this chapter, to empower his people to do things in his name, in his authority. The greater work is Jesus' work through his people. It's his work. It's his authority. It's done in his name, with his power, and with his spirit. So Jesus could say to his disciples after his resurrection, he could say, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Therefore go, go in that authority into all the world and reveal me to these people by your witness. We go only in the authority of Jesus. And therefore there is nothing for us to boast in. Jesus did his work in absolute humility he did his work in absolute meekness and lowliness. And that's how Christians down through the ages, following the, in the footsteps of Jesus, have gone about their business as well. There, there is a writer who uh, wrote about a, a, a town in France, or a small village really in France, where Christians had hidden Jewish families during the Second World War. He said what struck him about these families, about the Christians who were serving there, what struck him about them was their ordinariness. It struck him that they didn't look like heroes. They just looked like ordinary people, ordinary Christians. They were humble. They were normal. They were run-of-the-mill people who were simply living for Jesus. There was one old lady in that village who had a Jewish family in her home upstairs and a group of Nazi officers came knocking at the door. She opened and realised that the Jewish family she was hiding were done for. And so she faked a heart attack. So they had to attend to her rather than search the house. 
when she was later asked about what she did, she said this. Our pastor always told us that there would come a time in our lives when we would be asked to do something great for Jesus. So when that time came, we knew what to do. A heroic, life-saving act in the name of Jesus, but done by ordinary, humble Christians. After all, Jesus says, whoever believes will do the works I have been doing. Well, what were the works Jesus had been doing? Well, the last work Jesus had been doing was what? Was it some um, great display of power, some breathtaking miracle? Well, no, the work he'd just been doing was a work of complete humility. As Jesus got on his hands and knees and he washed his disciples' feet. That was the immediate context of the works he had been doing, was the work of servanthood, of humility. And Jesus said, by this, by this kind of work, by loving each other in this way, the whole world will know that you are my disciples. This is how I will reveal myself to the world, through these kind of acts of love and humility and service, by your love for each other. Now, in the early generations of the church, there was a letter written to a uh, Roman leader describing what Christians were like. There were many people wondering about these strange uh, Christian churches and these strange believers in this man called Jesus, whom they worshipped as God. And uh, one writer wrote to this Roman leader to, to explain a little bit more. And this is what he said. He said, Christians are not different from other people. They don't have a different language. They don't live in different countries. They don't have their own customs. They don't live in cities of their own or speak their own language. They just live wherever they've been placed. They wear the same clothes as other people. They eat the same food. They follow local customs. They marry. They have children just like anyone else. In other words, he's saying, look, these Christians, they're ordinary people. Quite run-of-the-mill people. They're just normal people. There's nothing special about them in that sense. If you were to go through their wardrobe, they just have clothes like anybody else. You know, some people, because of their uh, religious convictions, wear special robes or special uh, um, uh, way of dressing. But the person, the writer in this case, said you could look at Christians, they just wear clothes like anybody else. If you went through their fridge, they have the same food that anybody else has. They haven't set up their own towns just to live in their own communities. They don't speak a different language. Their dress sense is the same. Their diet's the same. They're, they're just regular people. They're ordinary. But then he goes on to say this. He says at the same time, they're incredibly unusual. They're ordinary people, and yet they're extraordinary people. He says this. They, they live as if they belong to another place. They live in their own cities. You know, they live in the place they were born or the place where they work. But they live there almost as if they were foreigners, as if they were citizens of another city. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the law, yet they go beyond the laws of this world. They love everyone, even though they're persecuted by everyone. They're killed, yet they gain eternal life. They are poor, yet they somehow make others rich. They are dishonoured yet they gain glory. They are mocked, and yet they bless others in return. They are treated terribly, yet always behave respectfully. So he's saying these Christians were extraordinarily ordinary. And in one sense, that is our calling as Christians. Paul said to the church in Corinth, he says, we have this incredible gospel that is in our hearts. He says the gospel that we have is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. It's this priceless treasure that we have, this incredible glory and eternal message of salvation. He says, and yet this incredible treasure is found in jars of clay. It's found in something very ordinary. We have something extraordinary, yet it's found in something incredibly 
ordinary, in the lives of ordinary people. We are both to be those who are ordinary, humble, modest, meek, and yet also those who have a greater work to do, a greater message to proclaim. And that work and that message is not our own. It's the work of King Jesus in us because he has gone to the Father to reign over his people as they do exactly what he's given them to do. You know, there's a king, King Henry III, not of England, but uh, in Europe there's a King Henry who was tired of being king. And the story goes that he decided he would give up his role as king and he'd become a monk. So he went to the local monastery and he spoke to the head monk there to explain his plans. And the monk said to him, he said, you do realise what you're asking. You do understand that you're giving your life, you're giving yourself to a life of obedience. It might be hard for you as a king to have to obey someone, but you will have to do, if you become a monk, you will have to do exactly what I tell you. The king said, yes, I, I do understand that. And I'm prepared to obey every word you say as you follow Jesus. Well said the monk. In that case, this is my first order to you. Go back to your throne and serve in the place God has called you to be. This is our greater work, to serve King Jesus wherever he has placed us to be. To live for him wherever he's placed us, so that we would follow, so that we would serve, so that we would witness that God may work a greater miracle of raising the dead to new life through faith in Jesus as we live and make known and proclaim and share the gospel. So let me join the dots here just so that we make sure that we understand how to answer Judas's question here. Why is it that Jesus revealed himself to the disciples but not to the world? Well, we see from Jesus's words that he revealed himself to the disciples so that he would reveal himself to the world. So that he would reveal himself to the world through the disciples, not by a display of great power, not by turning water into wine, not by walking on the water or feeding crowds of people, but through the greater miracle, the message of new life in Jesus as told by ordinary people. Just before we close, can I just mention these last two verses in this chapter, verses 30 and 31, because it does mention how Jesus will reveal himself to the world and it's through the cross. So verses 30 and 31 say, I will not say much more to you for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the father and do exactly what my father has commanded me. And I'll just briefly just walk through that as, as we close. It, it's a remarkable verse. Jesus says, the prince of this world is coming. He's speaking of Satan there. Remember, Satan had already in the previous chapter entered into uh, Judas, got a grip on Judas's life so that Judas would betray Jesus to death. So Satan is at work in this very specific way, bringing about the events surrounding Jesus's death. So when Jesus says the prince of this world is coming, he's referring to Satan's role at the cross. The devil's activities is heightened at the cross as he works through Judas and Pilate and King Herod and, and the crowds there in Jerusalem and the Roman soldiers as well. But Jesus says he, Satan, has no hold over me. Of course, Jesus has all authority. Satan's a powerful being, but Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. So he has no power over me. So the question is, if Jesus has all authority, Satan has no hold over Jesus, then why would Jesus allow Satan to, in some sense, orchestrate these events that lead up to the cross? Well, remarkably, Jesus says, I've got a purpose for Satan. I've got a purpose for what Satan is doing. What's Jesus's purpose for Satan's coming here, for his work at the cross. It says, he comes, Satan comes, so that the world may learn that I love the Father. It's an amazing statement. 
Jesus says the reason Satan is coming is to teach the world that Jesus loves his father and obeys his father. That the reason Satan has come into the world is to teach the world of Jesus's love. Obviously, that is not Satan's intention for what happened at the cross. He didn't desire that to be the outcome of his activity around the cross. But even Satan is under the authority of Jesus. He has no hold over me, Jesus says. Satan's intentions are evil and wicked, but Jesus takes those things that were meant for evil and he turns them for ultimate good, for the salvation of our souls through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And notice, therefore, that this verse helps us understand Judas's question. Why won't Jesus reveal himself to the world? Well, he will, according to this verse. He won't reveal himself through a miracle. Jesus isn't interested in being known as a miracle worker. Jesus has a far greater work with which to reveal himself to the world. And it is his work on the cross in giving his life for us. And therefore, our greater work is all bound up with the cross. It's bearing witness to the cross. It's sharing the message of the cross and speaking of the death of Jesus, the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Shall we pray as we close? Lord Jesus, we do thank you for this incredible chapter in your word. We thank you that we've had just this short time together to focus on just a few things in this chapter. Lord, help us uh, to really think on these words, to reflect on them. Lord, we thank you that you've chosen ordinary people like us, some ordinary backgrounds and, and different places, and you've called us to these extraordinary tasks, not because you saw something special in us, not because we were some diamond in the rough, but because you have chosen in your mercy to work through ordinary people. Lord, we are like jars of clay, just jars for ordinary use, as the Bible says, and yet contained in those jars of clay is the incredible, eternal, glorious message of the gospel, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God displayed in the face of Christ. Lord, we thank you that we have a great work to be about. That as we serve you wherever you've placed us in the seemingly ordinary uh, parts of life and parts of this world that you've placed us to serve, with seemingly ordinary roles and responsibility, responsibilities, yet in doing the tasks you've given us to do, you want to achieve a greater work. Uh, the, the raising of people from spiritual death to eternal life. And Lord, we thank you that you've chosen your people to, to, to bring that message to the lost, that we might be the witnesses you desire and that through us we may see a great work in our day as God uh, through his spirit works in our land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.